In today's video, we're gonna take a look at how to fetch or load data in the latest version of SvelteKit. If you're unaware, SvelteKit recently underwent some breaking changes, which kind of invalidate a lot of the content that's already out there on this subject. So I'm hoping that this video will help some of you all fill in the gaps and get on your way to developing your own SvelteKit applications. And this is a critical piece of it. So let's first start out with some of the SvelteKit documentation to understand how they expect us to load data within a SvelteKit application. So it states that a plus page.svelte gets its data from a load function. And if the load function is defined in a page.js, it will run on both the server and in the browser. And then instead, if it's defined in a page.server, it will only run on the server in which you can access private environment variables and make database calls. But in both cases, the return value, if there is one, must be an object. Pretty straightforward. We're going to have two, we're gonna actually going to cover both the page.server and the page.js JS in this video. And I've actually set up a little bit of an example application to demonstrate some of these concepts. I know it's beautifully designed. We have a nice nav bar at the top, which has home, shop, and movies. The shop page is going to be where we're going to start. And that's going to be with the plus page.js. So our application is just set up like this. We just have a shop and a movies directory page.js, page.svelte, that's all there is. Nothing else is really here. As the documentation said, a page.svelte receives its data from a load function, which is defined inside of a page.js file. So that means whatever we return here should get passed into page.svelte. So let's try it out. So if we type product here and just say iPhone 14, when we go into page.svelte, we open up some script tags, we can actually access that object with export let data. And then we can console log this data as well. Let me open up my console over here on the browser. And you can see here that we are getting that product back. So that's super simple to pass data between the page.js and the page.svelte. What we wanna do though, is we actually wanna request some external data. So we're gonna be using the dummy JSON API, which allows us, you know, as the name implies, to get some dummy or fake JSON data. And they have some products that we're gonna get access to. And we're going to do a limit of 10. So it allows us to limit and skip products. So we're just gonna grab this. Again, this isn't too important, the specific API. We're just hitting an API endpoint that gives us some data back, right? It's going to look like this. It's gonna be a response object with a products property that has an array of products, right? And that's what we're gonna to try to access. So inside of our page.js, before we can make any external fetch requests, we need to bring in SvelteKit's fetch, right? And that is passed as an input method to this load function. And we can check out what this does. If we go into here and we type fetch, we can see that it's equivalent to the native fetch web API with a few additional features. I'm not gonna read through all of these, but essentially it's what enables some of the spell kit magic to happen behind the scenes between the server and client interactions, okay? Now that we have this method here, we can actually use it as normal. It's it's not different to us as the developer. It just does different things behind the scenes. So I'm going to show you two ways to do this. I'm going to show you the way that I see people do it pretty often, um, or I've seen people do recently. And then I'm going to show you a better way to do this. And I'm going to demonstrate why one way is better than another. So let's just say we're going to get some products. We would call a normal fetch, fetch request like this. And then we need to get the product data. Uh, product res.json. This should be familiar to most of you. And then we will say const products equals products data dot products. Now our product data is inside of this product object here, right? And that's the reason that we did dot products is because the response object looks like this and we want to access the products, right? So now we can pass this here uh, into our shop with the shorthand, which is like this, or we can do it the regular way like this. Either way, it doesn't matter. Then inside of our page.svelte, as you can see, we have products that are being console logged and we can see that we have a products array here. So what I like to do inside of these page.sveltes is to destructure the data object. It just makes it cleaner and easier to work with. So we can say const products equals data, which is the same thing as doing const products equals data dot products, right? It just gets messy if you have a bunch of things you're trying to, to get out of that data object. Now we can render out all these products on the page pretty simply, right? We can just go each products as product. And then we'll say h1 product dot title. And then we'll say product dot description. And we'll actually make this an h2 and this a p tag. So now you can see on our shop page, we have all this content that's being pulled. And if we navigate back and forth, we can see. 
Now, behind the scenes, what's happening actually is that if we just refresh this page altogether and we take full control of our navigation, we're going to see that no fetch requests were made on our client. Everything was server-side rendered. But then if we go to, let's just say the home page and then the shop page, we could see that the products are fetched through a fetch request on the client, right? So that initial page request is handled by the by server-side rendering. And then subsequent requests are handled with client-side rendering. And then if JavaScript were to be turned off, then server-side rendering would take over for the entire application. So I can say um, disable JavaScript. And now if I clear this out and I navigate back and forth, you can see that it still works just as expected. It's just not happening from the client. And the reason they do that for the page.js files is because let's imagine that you had the client in this in Midwest United States, you had your Svelte kit server or backend on the East Coast and the external API on the West Coast. It doesn't really make much sense for you to have to take, you know, an extra round trip every single time that you wanted to get that data if you didn't have to, right? So with the page.js, this is a, a flex essentially uh, between server and client. So it's pretty cool. I want to finish showing you the way that I was saying was the way I've seen most people do this. Let's just say we want to get some users, right? Say this page requires multiple different API calls, different data sources. They're not really related to each other whatsoever. Let's just replace product with users here. And then we'll return this the same way. All right, let's re-enable JavaScript. I have it enabled still. Enable JavaScript, okay. Now when we refresh this page, we're going to see that, of course, I'm getting an error here. Let's see what I do wrong. I have two S's here. There we go. Okay. So as you can see, this page is working just as expected. We're not doing anything with these users just now on the page. We're not doing anything with them yet. But now when we navigate to home and to shop, we can see that we're making two fetch requests, one to products and one to users. And what I want you to pay attention to here is this. We've actually created a bit of a waterfall here because the user's request has to wait for the product's request to finish before it even starts. And if these two are independent of one another, like we're not using anything from this product's uh, response here inside of our user's request. So it doesn't really make sense for them to be, you know, chained like that in a waterfall. So what we can do is let's check the, the SvelteKit documentation. I'm going to show you where it states this at. So you can see it says that in the output, this is still under the load section here in the output, top level promises will be awaited which makes it easy to return multiple promises without creating a waterfall, which is literally what we just created right here. So what we can do is we can actually just return these promises from our load function and they'll be resolved and awaited on the page. So let's, let's just see how that looks here. We can define a function called fetch products and then we'll do the same thing for users. And then we'll need to adjust our uh, last line here. We're just gonna return product data dot products and we'll return user data dot users is what this is supposed to be actually it's not products it doesn't matter either way you are still able to see it so and we're not using these users i just want to show this as an example um, if you do need to request data from multiple sources right now instead of returning you know just products we're actually just going to return this call so fetch products and fetch users because these both return this returns a promise and this returns a promise and like it says here they will be awaited so you can return them just like that and now if we go here and we save it's going to server side render first because page refreshed but if we go to home and then to shop again we're going to see that those fetch requests were made but if we check it out here we can see that now they're running in parallel, which is how it should have been from the beginning, right? So this is the recommended way to, you know, when you have requests that are non-related, and even if they were, you would want to wrap them in the same function. That way, if ever down the line, you want to, you know, return multiple different promises, you can do so without having to wait them both inside the load function. And and most people are spoiled. And I think we're all spoiled when it comes to, to internet speeds, but there's people that are still running on, you know, 3G, for example, and you can see the difference in the speeds when you, when you switch over to 3G. Okay, enough of that. I'm going to remove the users here now because that was just to demonstrate. Now what I want to show you is prefetching, which is a pretty cool feature that Svelkit has. So let's just say that we have users on a slower connection or just anybody really want to improve the overall experience of our site. What we can do is since we know what's going to be populated on this shop page, we know that same request is being made. We can actually go ahead and have Svelkit prefetch that data when the user hovers over this link. And we can accomplish that by going into our layout here. And in this A tag here, we can just say data Svelkit prefetch. 
Then I want you to watch the browser here as what happens. When you hover over shop, you can see that fetch request is made. As soon as we click it, it's done loading instantaneously, right? And you can see every single time it automatically loads the page before. And you know, if someone's intent is to click it, that small amount of time still will make a difference in the user, user experience, especially if someone's running on something like fast 3G, for example, and we were to hard refresh this page, we can see how long that even takes with, with server-side rendering happening. And then if we hover over shop, we can see that it takes a couple of seconds before the product, before the fetch request even happens. But at least by the time they clicked on it, you know, that would cut off some of that time. That is the page.js. Now I want to talk about the page.server.js, which we're going to use within our movies page. So the reason I decided to do the movies page as a page.server.js is because I'm actually accessing data from the movie database API, which requires me to have an API key. So that's something that I would not want to expose on the client side, right? And we're just going to grab a few movies from this and render them into our page. Um, we can see here, here is the URL to get those movies. You can see my API key, I know, but it's okay because I'm going to delete it after this video. So don't stress out. Uh, we do have it defined as an environment variable as well that we're going to be able to pull in into our page.server. So unlike the page.js file, the page.server.js does not take in that fetch method from Svelkit. We just use regular node fetch for this, but I do need to import the environment variable so I can import .env slash config so I can actually access that environment variable. And we're just going to make a fetch request to that URL I just copied. So we can say const fetch movies. And then const uh, res fetch. I'm going to take the API key out and I'm actually going to pass that here through my environment variables. TMDB API key, I think is what it was. Yep. So that's going to be the request there. And then we're going to take response or data equals await res.json. And then I'm just going to return data dot results, I think is what it is. So we'll do the same thing we did on the previous page where we're just going to return movies. And then we're going to pass this function as the value. So the same thing uh, happens for page.server. It will still await and still uh, render that out properly. Now we can go over to our movies page and we can see here that we do in fact get a movies array, which is fantastic. What we can do is on our page.svelte, we can render those out. So First, I'm going to destructure that. So it's a const movies equals data. And then movies will just do in each block movies as movie. And then I think they have like movie.title and movie.overview. And movie.overview. And it keeps auto-correcting me there. All right, let's see how this looks. Yep, the movies did in fact render right away. And just to kind of demonstrate that this is not happening on the browser whatsoever, we can just throw a console log inside of this function here and say server load ran. And then inside of our console here on the browser, we will never see that happen. Same thing with the network tab. We won't ever see any fetch requests for this page, regardless if we move back and forth within this application. The only fetch request we're seeing here is from us hovering over that. Um, and we can actually apply the same, let's see here, let's clear this up. We actually apply the same prefetch for server side as well. So we can go into our navigation here. Let's just add that to the movies a tag as well. And we'll see behind the scenes, you'll be able to see the traffic here happening. If we hover over, let's go to home first, then we hover over movies. We could see that that server side rendering happened in the background. So now when we click movies, boom, it's instantly there. So the same thing applies. Really, the, the major difference between these two is again, the fetch request or the fetch method doesn't get passed into the server side. And you can actually use private environment variables. Um, you can use public environment variables in the regular page.js files. Um, but for ones that are more secretive that you would never want to expose on the client, that's where you would use the page.server.js. So I hope this video has been informative. If you have any questions, Questions. I do have a Discord server that I will leave a link to in the video description. Feel free to hop on there and ask me any questions you may have. And if not, I will see you guys in the next video.